this next session you're going to be hearing about tribal sovereignty and federal law and after that we will break for lunch and we will take a short walk over. Um, if you're not able to walk about the equivalent of a block and a half, please let us know and we'll give you a ride. Uh, we'll have lunch and we have uh, speakers talking about history and then when we come back we're going to take a group photo with the tribal leaders and then break up into your small groups where you get to have um, more time with the tribal leaders leaders to ask them more of the questions that you were asking this morning, uh, or as someone called it last night, speed dating with the chiefs. <laughs> so thank you, Lance, again. So at this time, I would like to introduce our Deputy Chief, Joe Crittenden, who some of you met last night at the reception, and he will introduce our next speaker. Thank you. Thank you, and I know you've been welcomed, but welcome again. The Cherokee Nation is honored this morning to have Michael McBride here today to talk with you about tribal sovereignty and federal law, something very important and, and special to all of us. Mike is the chair of the Crow and Dunlavey Indian Law and Gaming Practice Group. Throughout his career, he has represented over 20 Indian nations and their entities. His work has earned many awards, including being recognized by Best Lawyers in America for Native American Law and Gaming Law, and being named Oklahoma Lawyer of the Year for Gaming Law in 2012. He served as Justice of the Pawnee Nation Supreme Court from 2003 until 2012. For the next 45 minutes, he will give you a good foundation on tribal sovereignty. Then he will take questions from you for the next 30 minutes, and I know we're on time constraints and all that, so that being said, let's welcome Michael McBride. Thank you, Dick, Deputy Chief. Well, I'll tell you, it's a uh, great honor and uh, privilege to address uh, Leadership Oklahoma. Uh, I have a lot of respect uh, for this body, and it's so many, so many of you are, are leaders and uh, titans of the industry, and uh, political leaders, and so I, I just feel very humbled, excited, and actually quite nervous, uh, to tell you the truth, to, to address you about federal Indian law. But I figure I will tell you from my heart about my experience uh, uh, in being a, a tribal advocate, a uh, a, a advocate for federal Indian law, uh, a tribal justice, and, uh, and my experiences. Uh, I am a, uh, a graduate of uh, Leadership Tulsa, class of 26 in 1999 uh, through 2000, and I, I really got a lot out of, out of that experience. And I believe that these uh, experiences of coming together and talking about common issues with uh, people from broad uh, experiences are, are really uh, meaningful and, and, and quite beneficial. Uh, the, the friendships, camaraderie, and shared vision that, that you build from this experience uh, uh, is unmatched. I'd like to thank the Cherokee Nation, Lisa Long, uh, uh, Court Wart, uh, Thompson, and the, the other planners of, of uh, Leadership Oklahoma uh, for putting th this together and, and inviting me. Uh, I see a number of uh, my current and former clients in, in the audience, and uh, and uh, I'm, I also see uh, Governor Anna Tubby over here, uh, which actually heightens the the anxiety of uh, presenting on federal Indian law. Governor Anna Tubby has uh, been serving for more than a quarter century as as the leader of a major Indian nation, and uh, it's uh, really remarkable to to have him in the audience along with other other leaders. Attorney General Todd Hembry uh, is a friend and colleague and, and former client as well. And uh, it's, uh, this will be a, a, a really difficult uh, experience for me to, to try to condense 236 years of, uh, of history into 45 minutes of uh, federal Indian law and, and, and policy, you know, as, as well as the uh, the, the experience of, of Indian tribes, but I will try my best to um, uh, take on this daunting task and, and describe uh, the sovereignty of tribes, uh, uh, sovereigns that, that actually predate our United States Constitution. Uh, if time uh, 
at, at the end of this time period, I'd, I'd like to open it up to a, a robust discussion uh, of various uh, topics that, that you might be interested in about uh, federal law and, and policy and tribal state relations and uh, the powers of Indian tribes. I want to break up my, uh, my comments into basically uh, uh, four or five parts. First, I, I want to tell you about my personal history and uh, why federal Indian law became so important to me and uh, my, how my own uh, personal experiences as an Oklahoman uh, and a former tribal justice and advocate um, have really influenced me to, to do what I do. I'd also like to provide a, a baseline of statistics um, about uh, Indian tribes and Indian people as a race within our uh, United States and within Oklahoma. I'd like to discuss the, uh, the varying congressional policies that we've had over the, the, the past 200 years, the swing and pendulum of, of policies, and uh, give you a brief federal legal history. Being here in the Cherokee Nation uh, will make that easy, though, because uh, the, the first century of legal history, uh, the Cherokee Nation was at the forefront of, uh, of many of those foundational cases that formed the, the foundation of uh, federal Indian law. I'd like to discuss some of the, the shared experiences of, of Oklahoma and uh, Indian tribes. And then, if time permits, I'd like to do a, a quick book show and tell of some of the meaningful books on, on federal Indian law and history and, and tell you about some of those um, as time will, will permit. To start off, I want, I want to address race um, uh, head on. I'm a Scotch, Irish, English, French, white guy. And uh, you ask why I'm up here to you know, talk to you about Indian law. It's because I love it, and it's, it's something that I've uh, dedicated my, my life and my, and my passion to. Uh, blood is important in, in Indian law, and uh, the, during the, the first century of, of the United States, uh, Congress uh, passed laws that were specifically focused on blood of, of Indians as, as being the demarcation of, uh, of a, a number of rights, responsibilities. Uh, but being Indian is, is more than, uh, than blood. Uh, being Indian is a political definition, and it is a, a designation that Indian tribes as governments determine for themselves of who constitutes an Indian. For example, with the Cherokee Nation, uh, to be a, a Cherokee citizen, uh, their baseline within their constitution is to trace, trace back to the Dawes Rolls a role that was uh, created by the federal government back in the late 1800s that listed uh, Cherokee citizens and, uh, and some freedmen uh, as, as being uh, citizens of the nation. And so long as a, as a person can trace a direct lineal uh, descendancy from someone that was on that, that Dawes Rolls base for the Cherokee Nation, uh, the Cherokee um, Enrollment Office will uh, determine that, that you're a, a citizen of the Cherokee Nation. Other tribes have different definitions for what they consider to be a, a citizen of that nation. Uh, for example, uh, that the Comanche Nation, one of, one of, the, one of my clients that I, I, I serve as general counsel, uh, they do have a, a quarter blood definition um, and you have to trace back. Some tribes have a matrilineal uh, descendancy, so you have to trace through uh, your mother's line of, of family to, uh, to be a member of, of the nation. So there's lots of different uh, designations of uh, how one is, is a member. Uh, I am a fourth generation Oklahoman on my, uh, my mother's side. I'm a third generation Oklahoman on my, uh, my father's side. Uh, my, my grandfather on my mother's side was a farmer and a merchant uh, in Fairfax, Oklahoma, in Osage County. And my, my grandfather uh, was from Bartlesville. And uh, that was where I grew up, and uh, that was where I was born and raised. My, uh, my grandfather on my father's side uh, was an executive with Phillips Petroleum, and he worked with uh, Frank Phillips during the early years of uh, Phillips Petroleum, that, during the 1930s, 40s, and, and 50s, during an era of rapid growth. Phillips had relationships with the Osage Indians and uh, the vast mineral uh, estate wealth that, that they had, and a lot of the uh, uh, contracts that they, they had with the Osage helped uh, build uh, Phillips Petroleum into the, the company that it was. 
I grew up, uh, spent a lot of time with my grandparents in Fairfax. The Gray Horse uh, traditional uh, dance grounds, the ceremonial grounds of the Osage Nation are, are near Fairfax. And uh, I spent a lot of time uh, uh, with a lot of uh, different uh, Indian people. Uh, the Cherokees, uh, you know, around Bartlesville, the Lenape, Delawares, uh, the Ottawas, the Shawnees, the, the Choctaws, the Chickasaws. Uh, a lot of those uh, were my friends and, uh, and uh, relations in Bartlesville. Uh, another influence was uh, Woolarock. Uh, how many of you all have been to Woolarock up near Bartlesville? Wow. Well, that, that is just, just a fantastic facility. And, and as a child, uh, wandering through Woolarock and seeing the lodge and uh, all the, the history there really had a profound uh, impact on me, uh, not only for fascination with the history and Indian law, and political relations, but also art. Uh, it is a, a true Oklahoma treasure uh, that, that we have. I went to uh, a prep school in Arizona, uh, a boarding school experience, uh, and it was sort of like going to college early. And uh, a number of my uh, classmates were, were Native American there. Uh, I, I had a, a good friend, Maynard Natumia, that was a Hopi. Uh, uh, Gary So, that was Navajo, and uh, several others that were uh, from California mission tribes. And uh, that, that further had a, an, an influence on me as well. I went to Texas uh, to Trinity University in San Antonio, and there I, I learned about the, the, the great Comanche Nation, who were the lords of the plains during the, uh, the 17, 1700s and the 1800s and were an unconquered uh, uh, force from Mexico to uh, the Northern Plains uh, during that time period. And it wasn't until the advent of uh, repeating arms uh, that those uh, fierce uh, tribal warriors and horsemen uh, were uh, uh, finally uh, uh, met a match. Uh, that, that created a, another uh, fascination for me to, to learn about that history. Uh, I would commend to you a, a fantastic book that I read called The Empire of the Summer Moon that was published just a, uh, a couple of years ago uh, that chronicles the, the history of uh, the Comanche Nation, and Quanta Parker, and, uh, and some of that experience. Thereafter, I, I came back to Oklahoma and I went to OU Law School, and I, I had the, the great uh, opportunity to uh, have Renard Strickland, a, a Cherokee uh, Osage Indian, uh, as my uh, law professor. Uh, Renard Strickland was a renowned uh, uh, law professor. Uh, he went on to become a, a dean at a, a number of law schools around the, the country. And uh, he, he uh, recently uh, retired. Um, Renard uh, was the editor-in-chief of Felix Cohen's handbook on, on federal Indian law, uh, 1982 edition. And this was my Bible during uh, law school, and I, I still keep it at, at my desk side. Um, I will get to a little bit more history about Felix Cohen uh, in a little bit, but that's a picture of Felix Cohen uh, from the, the 1940s. OU really had a, a great impact on me with the American Indian Law Review, the only um, uh, journal uh, in the country that is dedicated solely to, to Indian law, and I, I served it as an editor on that. I also had a chance to clerk for Justice Yvonne Cogger of the Oklahoma Supreme Court. Uh, Justice Cogger uh, is now the the uh, longest serving member of the, uh, or the second longest serving member of the Oklahoma Supreme Court. And I believe that she's been on the court for over 30 years now. Justice Cogger uh, is the godmother of the Sovereignty Symposium, which is now in its uh, almost uh, third decade. Of, of existence. It's the annual symposium uh, that brings together uh, uh, legislators, uh, state leaders, tribal leaders, Indian law practitioners, and others that are interested in Indian law and policy uh, together to, to talk um, about important Indian law issues uh, and policy uh, every June. And uh, if you all are interested in, in, in uh, this topic, I would really encourage you to consider the Sovereignty Symposium uh, as, a, as a real important um, symposium. Um, I uh, came back to Tulsa in 1994, and I've, I've been practicing uh, Indian law there ever since, uh, representing tribes and also corporations that do business with tribes. 
Um, I've also taught as an adjunct uh, law professor at the University of Tulsa, uh, teaching uh, Indian law and advocacy and uh, oral arguments. Um, I've, I've also uh, been an attorney general uh, for a number of uh, Indian nations, and I, I currently am a attorney general again for the Seminole Nation of Oklahoma. And uh, I don't see uh, Chief Leonard Harjo here yet, but I anticipate that he will probably be here tomorrow. Uh, let me shift to the, the history and, and talk some about uh, the experience of Native American tribes in the United States. When uh, European uh, settlers first uh, came to North America in uh, 1492, um, the United States is populated with some five million Native Americans uh, with uh, hundreds of different Indian tribes uh, populating North America. Um, but from 1492 until about 1900, we saw the five million uh, Native Americans, uh, we saw that population collapse to approximately a quarter million uh, Native Americans. In the history of the world, that is one of the largest population collapses ever. And it, it's really a, a, a very shameful um, period of uh, expropriation, of uh, broken treaties, of betrayal, of genocide, and uh, a, a disease of conquered people and, uh, and a forced assimilation uh, uh, during that, that time period uh, between 1492 and 1900. Um, there was a, a period of allotment, of, of termination of, of Native American governments. But as, we've, as you've heard in the last few days, uh, Native American tribes are, are resilient. And Indian tribes have, uh, have really staged a, a tremendous comeback in, in the past century uh, through uh, policies of the federal government that have uh, helped reorganize and support Indian tribes. Another example that I want to give you of a specific tribe that I work with is the Pawnee Nation. The, the Pawnee Nation had approximately 22,000 uh, citizens in the 1700s, and uh, by 1900, their population had dwindled to 635 people. Uh, since that time, uh, the Pawnees now have approximately uh, 3,500 enrolled citizens. So the, the Pawnee Nation is also making it a comeback. Within the United States, there are approximately 567 federally recognized Indian tribes and Alaska Native groups. Uh, within Oklahoma, we have 39 federally recognized uh, Indian tribes, including the, the Great Cher Cherokee Nation, which has over 300,000 citizens and is the largest Indian tribe in the, in the United States now, uh, second only to, uh, or uh, the Navajo Nation is, is the, uh, the, the second. In, in preparation for day, today's talks, I uh, took a look at some population statistics just for comparison purposes. And uh, I saw that there are today approximately 3 million Native Americans within the United States out of a population of 317,651,000 uh, citizens, according to the uh, U.S. Census, uh, U.S. Population Clock website that I checked this morning. Uh, just for your own edification, we have uh, one birth every eight seconds. We have one death every 12 seconds. And we have one international migrant every 40 seconds coming into the United States. Of the um, 3 million, uh, that comprises approximately 0.9% of the U.S. population. But there are another 2.3 million that identify themselves as Native American and, and other races, which is another 0.7%. Uh, so that brings uh, approximately 1.5% uh, Americans identifying themselves as a Native American. The Oklahoma population, according to the latest statistic, statistics, statistics that I have, is uh, 3,751,351 people, with the second largest uh, Native American population in the United States. Approximately 10% of Oklahomans identify themselves as being tribal citizens. 
There are, as I mentioned, 35 or 39 federally recognized Indian tribes. Um, and uh, within Oklahoma, you know, we, we talked earlier about uh, casinos. Uh, of the 39 tribes, 33 have tribal state uh, gaming compacts with the state of Oklahoma. And uh, currently we have 120 casinos uh, within the, the state of Oklahoma. And they range in size from the, the gigantic uh, Chickasaw Nation Windstar Casino, which is on uh, exit one on I-35 on the Texas border, with uh, the, I believe, uh, and Governor, correct me if I'm wrong, it has over 6,000 uh, gaming devices uh, within the facility. And uh, believe it or not, it is the largest uh, casino in the Western Hemisphere uh, as of this date. Um, the Cherokee Nation uh, has a 14 county uh, jurisdictional area with the uh, Indian country uh, parcels uh, scattered throughout that, that 14 county jurisdictional area. Uh, the Cherokee Nation has a, a one uh, billion dollar, uh, inaccessible one billion dollar economic uh, impact on the Oklahoma economy uh, annually. Uh, they pay over uh, $400 million in salaries to uh, all of their uh, employees. And the Cherokees currently employ uh, 13,527 uh, Cherokees and non-Cherokee citizens uh, within their enterprises, casinos, and government. Uh, it's noteworthy that the Cherokees have a, a very uh, 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 important policy of employing Cherokees. And they have a uh, tribal employment rights office uh, that does a very good job of a uh, Cherokee preference. And uh, at their casinos, um, I'm told that, uh, for example, the Hard Rock over in Tulsa uh, is about 60% uh, Cherokee citizens that are employed within that facility, uh, which is a, a great uh, service to uh, tribal citizens uh, to, to have that opportunity. Let me um, shift now and talk about the nature of uh, Indian tribes and, and what they are. Uh, Indian tribes really exist uh, somewhat uh, outside of the, the constructs of the United States Constitution. They were not a party to the uh, Confederation of, of States uh, that came together to, to form the, the Constitution. However, Indian tribes are mentioned within the, the Constitution three times. There's what's called the Indian Commerce Clause, which uh, the U.S. Supreme Court has uh, determined uh, gives uh, Congress broad plenary, plenary power to legislate in the field of uh, Indian law and, and policy. And uh, there's a clause in there that says the Indians are not taxed. And uh, the Supreme Court has uh, had many occasions to interpret exactly what that means. But one thing that it does mean is that uh, it, it bolsters uh, Indian tribes as independent sovereigns, uh, free of, of state control and state jurisdiction. And that's one reason uh, why uh, Indians are not taxed uh, for gaming revenues and that these voluntary compacts uh, that are entered into the states uh, are, are not a, a tax uh, given to the state of Oklahoma, but rather they, they are a voluntary arrangement uh, for tribes to share revenue uh, with the states to, to overcome uh, certain issues of, uh, of mutual uh, assistance to our citizens. Uh, I'd like to go back to Felix Cohen again. This guy, he was the solicitor uh, for the U.S. Department of Interior during the 1930s. And he was there during a time period of uh, the Indian Re Reorganization Act that helped uh, tribes uh, form governments again and, and have constitutions and, uh, and uh, really uh, bring tribes back together again. It was during uh, Roosevelt's New, New Deal era and uh, Felix Cohen was a brilliant legal scholar and uh, he produced a, uh, a, a book that was published in 1941 called The Handbook of Federal Indian Law that was a desk book used by the lawyers at the Department of Interior uh, to, to deal with Indian issues. And Felix Cohen uh, had a quote, and I, I promise not to uh, uh, read to you too much, but this single paragraph I think really encapsulates 
uh, the power and sovereignty of Indian tribes. Cohen wrote in 1941 that the whole course of judicial decision decisions on the nature of Indian tribal powers is marked by the adherence to three fundamental principles. First, that an Indian tribe possesses in the first instance all the powers of a sovereign state. Second, that conquest renders the tribe subject to the legislative power of the United States and in substance terminates the external uh, powers of sovereignty of the tribe its powers to enter into treaties with uh, foreign nations, but does not by itself affect the internal sovereignty of the Indian tribe, i.e. its powers of self-government. Third, these powers are subject to qualification by treaties, by express legislation of Congress, but save as, the, as thus expressly qualified, full powers of external sovereignty are vested in Indian tribes and in their duly constituted organs of government. 